Have you ever had a camera body that you just like really, really loved? Something that you knew where all the buttons were, you knew what all the functions did, and you just loved it, you had everything perfect, but then as the years went by, you wished it did some small things slightly differently. That's kind of the mentality I think Canon went with when they built the Canon 5DS and Canon 5DSR. It's basically the same shooting experience as with the Canon 5D Mark III. The images are just a lot bigger. There's a couple things that I want to talk about with regards to the Canon 5DS and the Canon 5DSR. Both cameras are designed to deliver enormous megapixel images, 50 across, which is comparable to what you find out of a CMOS back on any Phase 1, Hasselblad, or the Pentax medium format cameras. They're big, and I think what they wanted to do was to give us the option of creating these enormous images for whatever purpose we wanted. Maybe we wanted to crop more, maybe we wanted to print larger. It doesn't matter. The fact of it is, we can do it. But all those megapixels don't come for free. We had to give something up, and in this case, we had to give up ISO performance. Canon really pushed down the latitude that this thing had on ISO. Usually we're used to seeing stuff way, way up there, but this caps out at 6400. Now, this is probably done because past 6400, the ISO just got really, really poor. So Canon just capped it where they thought this is the best it can do. And 6400 is pretty good in a lot of light situations, and I don't know why you would be shooting with this in certain situations anyway if it got darker than that. This is kind of a portrait and or landscape camera, and if you're shooting landscapes, odds are you're gonna drag anyway. The, the likelihood of shooting at ISO 6400 isn't particularly high. From a shooting perspective, this sort of feels exactly like shooting with the 5D Mark III with one exception, the buffer. I'm not using a card that's any slouch. I'll show you right now. It's a 64 gigabyte SanDisk Extreme 120 megabyte a second card. I bought this card specifically for shooting medium format. So I wasn't expecting any problems when I put it in this camera. And I don't think this is going to be something that's solved by faster cards. I think this camera just has a lot of data to write and it takes a little bit of time for it to put it down. The buffer on this camera is somewhat slow. You can fire a lot of images, maybe five to 10 before it totally caps out, but to actually write those images to the card does take time. You fire an image and you expect to see the image on the back of the camera relatively instantly with most of the cameras we've seen on the market. With the 5DS and 5DSR, you'll have to wait a couple seconds. It's writing that data and it does take time. These images are huge and this thing is not particularly fast at showing you what you've shot. So with the exception of how long it takes to render images to a memory card, this camera physically is exactly the same as the 5D Mark III. Holding it, shooting it, controlling it, all the buttons, the placements, everything is exactly the same as the 5D Mark III. So really there's not a lot we have to talk about when we look at it from that perspective. What we have to really focus on is how the camera performs from an image capturing perspective. How do they look? What's the dynamic range? Where can we shoot? What ISO variances can we take a look at? How does the video look? These are all things that sort of only matter once we get the images and files back into a computer. So we can take the camera and set it aside for now and instead focus on the images that it captures, what lenses worked best, and where we can expect to get the most out of this camera and what we think it's best suited for. So one of my concerns coming into this review was how different lenses were going to perform when they resolved on this much, much more pixel dense sensor. This is the most megapixels Canon has ever squeezed into one of their sensors, and I had concerns over how that was going to affect the resolution, the sharpness, and the overall quality of an image. So what I wanted to do was compare two lenses that I was going to use a lot of, the 35mm f1.4 from Sigma and the 24-70 f2.8 from Canon. And what I did is I set up about three feet from this bush, and I wanted to see how the sharpness looked at exactly the same place. So it, with the Sigma, when we zoom in to 100%, that's what we can expect. And when we zoom in on the Canon, we can compare and see that besides a slight difference in how the two lenses were looking at exposure, even though it was the exact same settings, we get a kind of an idea of how we should expect sharpness out of it. Now, this isn't the sharpest image I've ever seen, and I'm not sure if that's because the lenses aren't used to working with the sensor or, or what. I mean, I can't really say it's going to be the lens's fault, 
because we know how sharp lenses, the 35 for example, is on other cameras. So I mean, this part right here looks really good. It's less good on the on the 24 to 70, but you know, overall, it looks pretty comparable. If we come back out on, let's do come out on the 35, and we go down to the corner. And look at how the corner is resolved. The 35 versus the 24 to 70. And the 35 is, it's a, it's a hair better down here. You can see this is starting to get a little, little wavy, a little mushy. But it's nothing hugely, hugely noticeable. It's still pretty sharp. So. I think that's a good way to say that I think the 35 millimeter is of course performing a little better as expected, but both of them are good. And that'll give us a good baseline when we move forward. So, okay, so this is about three feet from a subject. Let's go a little farther away. So when we shoot landscapes, that's where we're gonna be. So here's a real boring landscape, but has some pieces in it that we can look at. So let's zoom in on the 35 millimeter again, 100%. We're gonna look at the top of this building. If we look at these, I mean, they're really close. At this distance, at 5.6, 35 millimeters, I can't really see a difference at all. And that's a good sign. If we come down here to the, the ground level on both cameras, I actually think that the 24 to 70 did a better job down here than the 35 did. So now we have a baseline of what we can expect out of this lens, the 24 to 70 L2. And I'm going to take this specific one out and shoot a bunch of images with it. We're going to look at some of those and can look at the dynamic range, the ISO performance, that sort of thing. So for the remainder of what we're going to do in RAW, we're going to use Digital Photo Professional 4 because it's the only platform we can use right now that supports RAW. Adobe's platforms aren't yet supporting 5DS or 5DSR files. So we'll have to do with this. Um, so this is a photo that I overexposed while out by the beach, and I would normally delete this photo, but for this, this is going to be a good example of how far we can bring in those highlights. At what point is this photo gone? Uh, so this is the highlights portion of the dynamic range. So I'm going to come over here and bring the brightness adjustment down three stops. And already you can see that it did bring in a significant portion of this, although we are still completely blown in the major highlight areas. But we did get a lot of detail back in the ocean. We can totally see the ship in the distance, and the foreground actually got so shadowed that we have way more here than I thought we did. Uh, I can continue to bring down a little bit more and pull the highlights just slightly, but. I think the, the best we got were those, that, that, that range of three here. Uh, the shadows, we were, we're probably going to have to use a different photo for to test the shadows, but as far as highlights go, that's what you can expect out of the 5DS. Uh, it's good. It's not the best I've ever seen, but it's, it's pretty good. Okay, so here's an image that I took that is clearly a little under everywhere except right here. And that's because I was shooting an aperture priority and I aimed the camera right at this point. So everything that is not <laughs> directly underneath this floodlight is of course gone. But this is a good image to see exactly what can we recover out of it. So this time we're gonna move the brightness up to three and see what that shows us. Oh, well, we look at that. That is significantly more than was visible before. We can push the shadows a little bit more. And you can see that we did get a lot out of the shadows. This is actually not uncommon in my experience, where you can get more detail out of the shadows than you can out of the highlights with a lot of digital sensors. And that, of course, is not lost here either. Now, we don't have any detail here. We have no detail here in this sweater or in his pants. He got a little bit of his hand left. But what we did get is all these buildings in the background. We can actually start to see the sky. And this entire area around the floodlight is completely revealed. So that's pretty good. I'd say this is slightly better than what we were getting out of the highlights reductions. So here's a photo that I took in San Francisco at night where I dragged for a few seconds to see what kind of colors the Canon would gravitate towards in a night scene. 
Now when looking at files from this camera, I actually have found that the color rendition of it is a lot better than I was expecting. You see, in some of the other cameras that Canon has produced, especially in night shots, I get a lot of saturations in oranges and reds, and not nearly enough in the blues and greens. With the 5DS though, I did find that the blues and greens were really well done. It didn't get overwhelmed by much of the oranges, which is something that I think is a rather of a characteristic of Canon cameras, which makes them really good at capturing people, but less so at landscapes. It's good to see that the 5DS is capable of actually getting some really nice rich blues that really help offset any reds in the frame and makes all the colors look that much better. You can see here without really any adjustments at all, the image looks really good. And I can probably bring up the shadows a little bit if I wanted to, if I wanted to change the exposure, which I don't want to do. I actually liked it exactly how I shot it. Um, maybe if I wanted to bring the highlights down a little bit, pump the shadows just a hair. I mean, these are all little minor things, but the main thing I want to focus on here is the colors of the night sky and how the lights on the bridge were each rendered individually. One other area I want to look at and kind of show you guys is how this camera was adjusting to shadows and highlights blending into each other. And from out here, this, this photo actually looks pretty great, but I do want to move in closer and examine the cheek of my dog. So this is at 200%, and I know we would never be in here at this uh, zoomed length, but this is going to illustrate something that I think could be improved about this camera. If you look at the darkest shadow point here, and you also look at where we have the highest highlight in this area here, the transition between the highest highlight and the darkest dark here is maybe one or two visible gradients. So you see this is, would be the in-between zone right here would be right as it transitions to black and then we're immediately black. And what I like to see out of cameras, and I see this out of some other cameras that I've shot, is you'll see a very gradual gradation into the shadows and highlights and highlights to shadows back and forth, rather than such a steep drop in the image that you see here. I think those that complain about Canon sensors are generally complaining about things like this. And though it takes a real pixel peeper to really be bothered by something like this, it is something that I wanted to point out because it has not been fixed on this new sensor from Canon. It's basically doing exactly the same thing that the 5D Mark III does, as well as the 6D and any of the other high-end Canon cameras that are out there. It has a difficult time slowly transitioning between shadows and highlights, and it will drop quickly um, between the two. An aspect of this camera that I do appreciate is that the ISO performance is generally pretty good across the board. I mean, when you get up higher, I don't recommend taking photos out there, but in video it performed in a way that I wasn't expecting. From ISO 100 through 1600, I would consider all of this usable footage, especially if you're tripoded. For stills, I would stay below 1600, and it's clear why they chose a cap of 6400, because you could tell it's deteriorating quickly. But what you get here is quite good, and I wouldn't be too concerned with it, especially if you use this camera for what it's supposed to be used for. So I guess really the last thing we have to talk about is the video quality of this camera. What do you think? Why am I asking you? Because this whole segment that I've been sitting here on, I've shot on the Canon 5DS. That's what I've got going on over there. So if you like how this looks, and I actually don't see much of a problem with it, it looks like a very nice high-end Canon camera, then you're set. The video actually was surprisingly good. I'm quite satisfied with it. It's not a video camera by any means, and any autofocusing that you do in the video is pretty unusable. But if you're going to have a st steady, stable camera set up in a room and you're shooting something like an interview like this, I don't see why you couldn't use this camera. It doesn't have audio monitoring, but it does have HDMI out. So if you use something like a Atomos Ninja Blade, that does have audio monitoring directly in that little screen. So you're set there. So if you guys have any questions or comments about this camera and want to know a little bit more information on things maybe I didn't cover to the depth that you wanted, make sure you leave a comment in the YouTube section below or on resourcemagonline.com in the full written review with the link down below. Thanks for watching and for all things Canon 5DS as well as the whole world of photo and video, make sure you keep it locked to resourcemagonline.com.